Hello, dear friends. May God bless all of you. May the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of peace, may He bring such peace into your life, into you, in your soul, and through you, it will be taken to others as well. All the souls that you live with, your family members, your cycle of friends. And I'd like to share with you today a thought, a biblical thought, which, by the way, it's a thought which God gave to Solomon. You know Solomon well, right? He was the richest man on the face of the earth. He was the wisest man on the face of the earth. He was the man that lacked absolutely nothing, nothing in his life, nothing. Everything that his eyes desired he satisfied its desire. There was absolutely nothing that his eyes saw that he withheld it from it, that he didn't, let's say, give into it. So you can imagine what Solomon was like. And even still, with everything he had, with everything still he sinned against God. He revolted against God. We can put it this way. And in his old days, when he converted, he said the following words. I have seen everything in my days of vanity, which means that even though he was who he was, the richest, the most powerful, there was no one richer, no one wiser, there was no one who could do everything they wanted the way Solomon did. Solomon was like Adam and Eve in paradise. They had everything. They lacked nothing. They lacked absolutely nothing. They had from the very best available because there was no sin. But when sin came into existence, then death came into existence. Before sin, man lived, we can say, a glorious life here on earth. There was no poverty, misery, injustice, evil, envy, none of these things. Everything was perfect. Even the animals were perfect. They would keep company to Adam and Eve. And there was no animosity, there was no wickedness. However, what can be done? People naturally think, well, if I have money, I will be happy. But it's not the case at all. Solomon said that the more a person has, the more trouble they also find. Did you know that? In his wisdom, he said, he said, the more a person conquers, the more they will suffer. The more they will burden their soul. But he said the following, the text that I'd like you to, to know. I have seen everything in my days of vanity. And what did he see in the days of his vanity? I have seen everything in my days of vanity. Lust, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, etc. I have seen everything in my days of vanity. 
There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, who suffers in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. He saw that, he observed that there were righteous perishing in their righteousness and there were as well wicked men who prolonged life in their wickedness and this obviously you m may think oh this is not fair if God is righteous how can he allow this to happen the righteous perishes in their righteousness no Solomon said that there is a just man he's not saying that all just men will perish in their righteousness he's saying that there is a just man who perishes in his righteousness as well as there are wicked men who prolong life in their wickedness this is unfair but he saw this happening he saw this discrepancy in his time. However, praise God, praise God that God has given us tribulations. God has allowed us to go through tribulations because tribulations to those who live by faith, they are blessings. But those who don't live by faith, those who don't know God, tribulations are a living hell. So, you will understand here why God allows the tribulations to come. Why He allows them. Which is perhaps what you are going through in this exact moment. In this instant, you are going through a storm. We all go through storms. And I can tell you one thing. The days that I had more experiences, the day that I was in honeymoon with God the most, let's put it this way, were the days of tribulation. Paradoxically, this is a reality. Because when we are being tribulated, we have our head bowing down, inclined. But when we do not face tribulations and life is easy, everything's flowing well, then we sit back and relax. And that's where danger lies when the devil went to speak to Eve, he chose a moment that she was all alone, not when she was with Adam. He waited for Eve to be alone because once she was alone, it would be easier to defeat her. And that's what happened. Therefore, dear friends, Sometimes when we are relaxing, that's where danger comes, that's where danger lies. Because the thought, the ideas, the imagination of man's mind starts to flow and these ideologies, ideas from hell. And usually the person gives up to this. Pay attention. Why did I say, I say and I repeat, that the Bible teaches us that tribulations are blessings in disguise and you must take advantage of them. Especially if you say, Bishop, you have no idea what I'm going through. Well, I've been through as well many, many tribulations and I haven't died. I have not lost my faith. Pay attention. 
the Apostle Paul, let's go to the New Testament now. The Apostle Paul, used by the Holy Spirit, write to the Christians in Rome. The Christians from that place were newly converted in the times of the emperors, especially in the times of Nero, one of the Neros. And he said like this to those Christians who had had experiences with the Lord Jesus, had an encounter with the Lord Jesus. He says like this, pay attention, dear friends. There in chapter 5, of the letter to the Romans, the church in Rome. Therefore, having been justified by faith, Paul is saying that when we are justified by faith, which is what happened to those Christians in Rome and happens today to all of us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, to be justified by faith means, dear friend, that the person was forgiven by their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were lost in their sins and trespasses. They were dead to God. They were dead, separated from God. However, they heard the word of God they paid attention to his words and they gave their life to Jesus. They believed in the Lord Jesus. They repented from their sins. They were baptized in water. They received the Holy Spirit. So they were justified before God, meaning their sins disappeared. They vanished. They vanished. They are now clean, justified, which means they've been acquitted. They were acquitted by God himself. And when this happens, he says here, we have peace with God. When we are justified by faith in the Lord Jesus, it's not by church attendance, it's not by the religious beliefs that we uphold, let alone by the charity works we do. No, we are justified before God because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we believe that his sacrifice was valid in our lives, when we embrace our faith in the Lord who died for us, he died without any sin in order to carry our sin, to remove our sin, to erase our sin. He had to take my sin in order for me to be made righteous before God. Because no one is righteous before God. Every human being is born in unrighteousness. They all sinned. They all sinned. The Bible says that as through one man sin came into the world, also because of this sin, death came into existence, separation from God. But just as death was passed on to all men because they've all sinned, so everyone needs this faith in the Lord Jesus in order to have their sins forgiven in order to be righteous before God. God is the judge of judges, the Lord of lords. In order for you to be justified and righteous before him, someone paid the price for your sins, which was Jesus. If you believe in him, in the Lord Jesus, when a person believes in the Lord Jesus, indeed, with sincerity, not just more or less, not because they attend a church and were baptized in water. It's not because of that that their sins 
or justified. No, but because they died to the world. They died to the lusts of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, things of this world. So when a person truly embraces their faith, their belief, they have a commitment, a covenant, they marry the Lord Jesus, then they are justified. So it says here, therefore, having been justified by faith, not by good works, but by faith. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the person says, I'm a Christian, I'm from church A, B, C, I belong to church, I'm an assistant, I'm a member, I'm a pastor, a bishop, a female bishop, I am a, an active member in my church. But if you have no peace, then you are not justified. You are still in sin. You are still lost in your sin and trespasses. Meaning, you are still dead before God because you are not justified. This justification only takes place when there is a solid faith, a concrete faith, palpable, visible, when the person has a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to what is written, a faith that is practical, then they have peace with God. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they have peace with God because that person had faith to surrender their life to his son Jesus. And that's why he said, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have such peace inside of them, for sure, for sure, will have problems on the outside, which are the persecutions, hatred, envy, jealousy. Many people are envious of those who are of God because you have peace. You are happy. You are happy yourself. You are happy within you. Even though your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, your loved ones, they may not be happy, but you are happy. This is glorious. This is too strong. So pay attention. This is very glorious. We have peace with God, with the Father, because we have believed, we have our living faith, active and practical in the Lord Jesus Christ, His Son. And of course, those who do not believe in the Son, how can the Father justify them? How can the Father acquit them from their sins? It's not possible. Would you be capable of, you know, someone knocks on your door and says, listen, Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, I came here in the name of your son or your daughter, and I'd like you to help me to do this, to give me some food, for example. I'd say, I ask you rather, would you deny food to that person? No, because they were sent to you by your son or daughter. You're going to say, of course, of course immediately you would give them food. However, if the person comes on their own, alone, you know, 
a John Doe in life and knocks on the door and says, give me food. You may give and you may not give. You might get scared and look through the peephole on the door and see that you don't know that person and not even open the door. However, if you are a person of God, you for sure will understand if someone knocks on your door and says, so and so, Mrs. so and so, Mr. so and so, I came here in the name of your son, Richard or Mary and so on. Immediately, you are going to help that person, won't you? The same happens with people who believe in the Lord Jesus. We are justified before God through faith in the Lord Jesus. Once you are in Jesus, marrying Jesus, being one with the Lord Jesus, then you live in faith and consequently you have peace from God within you. Then you live well within yourself. Your soul is at peace. There is no anxiety. There is no worries or preoccupations about tomorrow that make you lose your sleep at night. No, there is no fear. There is no terror in you. You do not lose your peace because our Lord Jesus, you are in our Lord Jesus. You are in Jesus. And those who are in Jesus are new creations. It's written, they are a new creation. The past is gone. They have peace. Those who are in Jesus, Jesus is peace and they have peace. So, the text, it's interesting. I really, really like this verse. He says, Having been justified by faith, faith, sincere faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Comma. Through whom, meaning through Jesus, also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, which means we have access by faith to this grace, meaning any time of the day or night, any situation, you have access to God's presence because the door of the throne of the Most High is always open to His children. You can speak to him at home, at work, in church, on the streets, in a car, in a moment of danger. Any time you, you are with him, you can enter his presence. Then he says, he says, and we rejoice, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Meaning that if you live by faith in the Lord Jesus, you have peace with God, with the Father, and you live in this grace. It's free. It's free. It's a favor that God is doing to us, even though we don't deserve, because we believe in, his, in the Lord, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that, He says as well, but we also glory, pay attention, in the hope of the glory of God. The hope of the glory of God. The hope that, you know, let me explain this better. You who are about to get married and you are preparing everything, you're preparing yourself, you're young, or perhaps you're not young anymore. You are preparing yourself for your wedding day. So you obviously have the expectation, that hope, isn't it? That glorious moment that you're going to meet your bride or your groom, your future spouse. So you get happy. 
just of thinking about that day. I, I think, I'm thinking right now of the day of my wedding, the days before my wedding. Wow. I'll speak about this another day. But it's glorious. Now, imagine you the joy that it is. One day, one day, you carrying within yourself the hope that one day you will be before the glory of God, His magnificent glory. So we who live by faith in the Lord Jesus are justified and such justification brings us peace. We have peace with God, so we live at peace. So the problems that we face, the struggles, the hardships, so on, the tribulations, they are nothing before this permanent peace that is inside of each of us. Because this peace gives us the certainty, the absolute assurance that sooner or later we are going to meet with the glory of God. We are going to see Him face to face. And then, come on, you just have to celebrate, as they say. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice. The young man, the young lady about to get married, the youths who still don't know what marriage is like, so they have that expectation, that hope. They are looking forward, as it happened to me, of one day, for the day to come. My day was on a Saturday, and I went to meet Esther on the altar. Wow. Wow. I enjoyed that expectation, counting the hours, the the minutes, the seconds, until the day finally arrived. And when the day came, I can't stop here without speaking about this, because it explains well what this means. It explains exactly what Paul is saying here. I was so happy. I was the, let's say, the happiest groom in the face of the earth. I was smiling. I was laughing at all times. I was, I was very happy. And everyone noticed. And Esther, she was even shy because I was so... Because that hope, that expectation I had at all times as a single man, finally that was coming to pass now. I was going to be hers, and she was going to be mine forever. We would be together our entire lives here on earth. Now imagine this hope of one day being with the Lord for all eternity, serving the Lord personally, serving the glory of the Most High, seeing the glory of the Most High, have you imagined this, dear friends? That's why Paul said, for me, to die is gain. And for me as well. If I could go now, I would go happily. Happily. Why? Because this world has nothing to offer, nothing to add. The, the world only tries to take away, take away our peace, our tranquility, etc., etc., However, when we are at peace with God, we have this certainty, we have this conviction, we are strong enough to face the tribulations, the struggles, and the challenges. And it's very nice. We stand in this and rejoice, and rejoice in the hope the hope, we don't see hope. We know, we believe in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, that's not all. This is already enough, but that's not all. He also says, but we also glory 
and tribulations. We also glory in tribulations. Meaning, we do not just glory in that eternal future of the glory of God. And one day to be before the face of the Most High, the Creator, our eternal Father. But we also glory in tribulations. Tomorrow I will speak more about this. You should take your Bible and read these first five verses from chapter 5. So Romans chapter 5 verse 1 up until verse 5. Read it carefully. Don't read it in a hurry. Don't try to read it as though you were reading a romance or an adventure book and you want to know the ending already. No, don't do that. The Word of God, you must eat it and enjoy it every moment. Even the commas, you must pause, breathe, because it's very glorious. It's solid food to your soul. And I'm sure that your soul will be at peace when you read this text. Romans chapter 5, from verses 1 to 5. Read these five verses because it's what we are going to talk about tomorrow. May God bless you all, and I see you tomorrow in the name of Jesus. Amen.